He says, I'm going to do the solo thing and then I'll bring you all in. So he starts doing the solo piano thing. And I had never heard a piano played like that. It was just scary. And I'd seen lots of great jazz players. Right? <laughs> you know, loved Oscar and Ray stuff and Bill Evans. I'd see every night at the Vanguard. Dr. Johnson is playing this New Orleans thing, this solo. And I wanted to run from the stage. I was I don't, I don't need to be here. I'll, I'll be in the dressing room. What's up, folks? Happy New Year and welcome to episode 101 of the Bay Shed podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. I hope everybody had an enjoyable holiday season. Uh, Things are pretty low key. These are pretty low key for me. I did go back to Phoenix for a little bit, hung out with my family. Uh, my folks are back there. My sister's back there. My brother lives out here, but uh, we both went back. They hang out in Phoenix for a couple days. That's always cool. It's always a little surreal every time I go back to my hometown. Uh, you know, you see how the city changes and things and all the little the things you don't even think about. You did things I don't even think about. Like, I'll be driving through a specific part of the neighborhood. All of a sudden, all these memories come back. It's, it's always kind of a surreal experience. But but I had a great time uh, while I was there. This year for New Year's Eve was probably the first year in like 20 years. I did not have a New Year's Eve gig, and I was kind of okay with it. <laughs> I didn't miss... I didn't miss the whole the whole thing. Uh, obviously, as we all know, like New Year's Eve gigs pay way better, so that part's always cool. But but uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed finally having a New Year's Eve off and uh, just hung out, just hung out and did not go out. It was raining here in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, I just didn't do anything. Like actually, that day, me and my brother watched college football. Which for anybody that watched the college football, like the the TCU Michigan game was insane. Uh, so we watched that at this little place over in West LA, and then we just hung out the rest of the night, and that was it. That was New Year's Eve. That's how I rang in the new year. It was pretty pretty fun, pretty fun to just not do the thing, not do the gig. You know, where you got to go set up at like five. <laughs> you got to go like set up at five. Uh, do the sound check, do the whole thing, and then you're waiting. You don't go on till later, and then you're finally done. And you know, just dealing with traffic and all that at the end of the night. Like, yeah, happy to have had New Year's Eve off. All right, all right. What else is going on? Uh, what else is going on? Bay Shed Academy. Okay, so this this is starting to take a uh, really nice shape. You know, the more I was thinking about it, um. I can't, I, I can't just start like a lessons program, even even with some of the, the things that are going to be coming up with the remote lessons from guys all over the country um, and things like that. That's really exciting. I had to I did have to kind of uh, bump that back a little bit only because as I typically do, I took on way more than I could handle at one time. So um, that's we're looking at like April to release a lot of the remote lessons with the other teachers. Well, but I also was thinking about like what on the local level, you know, on any local level, not just in Southern California. I think that there's a there's this hole in in the base community. And that hole is that for the for the kids in like middle school to high school. I know some colleges have like popular music courses and stuff like this. Um but really, like when kids are young and probably just beginning to start playing the bass, and from talking to all these people, uh, all these bass players on the podcast that I have, you know, so many, so many of us have gotten into the instrument, you know, in the teenage years, and there's no, there's no real way to get plugged in, in the in the school system, you know, like where you can kind of play with other people, unless. And I, and I do think this is also why <laughs> the bass player uh, journey is typically like, you know, the the extra guitar player in a band. Like, ah, dude, we got two guitar players. We don't need you. So why don't you play bass? 
uh, and a lot of bass players stumble into the instrument that way. But I don't think there's enough representation uh, in schools and stuff to let to let young people, uh, per- prospective bass players, know what this instrument's all about. So that has become one of the agendas of the Bass Shed Academy is to go into the local school systems and and do some presentations and do some playing and and bring some different uh, guests, performers and teachers in to the school systems to kind of let these kids know that like you don't have to play in the jazz band at school and you don't have to play in the orchestra at school to still do something with this instrument or or be creative. Like who knows if they're ever going to continue on playing. I think the amount of people that start an instrument during that age, eh, the per- I, can't, I, I don't know what it would be, but the percentage of those folks that continue on with the instrument later in life, probably not a big percentage, but, but I think that the bass itself should be better represented to those kids and in, in those platforms, in those platforms, I don't know if there's a platform. Uh, but th- these kids should know about it. You know, they should know more about the, a little bit of the history of the instrument. I don't got to dig all the way into like some Leo Fender schematics. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think they're interested to know uh, how Leo Fender was winding his pickups. But, but I do think that uh, a little bit more, a little bit more press for the bass can be a good thing. Uh, to kids in the middle schools and in the high schools if they're not going to be interested in the jazz band or, or playing classical. So that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing with the Bass Shed Academy in addition to uh, the lessons at Lemur Music and in addition to the remote lessons. Uh, that launch party is coming up uh, still this weekend, January 7th. We're going to have the launch party for the Bass Shed Academy at Lemur Music. Uh, thankfully, some folks have already signed up and RSVP'd. Really looking forward to that. Really looking uh, forward to the weather <laughs> being cooperative. Uh, right now, it looks overcast, so we might have to make some amendments because, as it stands now, we're going to be had this little outside tent, and me and me and some of the other instructors there are going to be doing some performances. So that's that's a little bit of what how the Bay Shed Academy is taking shape. Um, yeah, getting a new website together for specifically just the academy. And going to be making some amendments to the Base Shed website. Um, and I will keep you all updated on that. Speaking of the launch party at Lemur Music for the Base Shed Academy, I will be headed down to Lemur Music tomorrow to uh, meet with another bass player, uh, David Grisman's son, Sam. Um, if you guys remember, uh, I'm going to have to look it up. Now, this is embarrassing. Like, I should have... Excuse me, I really should have... I know, done my own homework on my own podcast here. <laughs> um, I believe let let's let's see if I'm accurate, huh? We're gonna play a little game here. Uh, I think it was episode 32 that Jim Kerwin was on, and that's all I'm looking up is the episode Jim Kerwin was on because Jim Kerwin uh, played with David Grisman and Jerry Garcia. Oh, episode 33, man, I was close. Episode 32 was Trevor Jones. Um, so, yeah, on episode 33 was my talk with Jim McCurwin, who played with David Grisman and Jerry Garcia in that project. And tomorrow I'm headed down to Lemur to chat with uh, David Grisman's son, who is a bass player and has a group and is looking to do some, some small little tour dates uh, around Southern California. He's going to be down at Lemur uh, getting his bass worked on. And I'm going to go down there and hang. Yeah, so that should be fun. That should be fun. Check out lemurmusic.com for everything you need for the double bass. Uh, there's also information there on the site about the Bass Shed Academy. Uh, so for double basses, stop by lemurmusic.com. Use the promo code the bass Shed, all one word, for 10% off. On the episode is bassist Tony Garnet. Tony has played with Bob Dylan for quite some time. It's been kind of his main gig. Tony joined Bob Dylan in 1989. Uh, that's that's a pretty that's a good run. <laughs> that's a good run to play with a legend. Now, in addition, in addition to playing with Bob Dylan, uh, Tony has also worked with Tom Waits, Paul Simon, uh, Asleep at the Wheel. He's done some movie soundtracks, which he will talk about. That's really fascinating to me. And played with the Saturday Night Live band. 
Uh, so Tony, Tony gets around originally from Minnesota. Tony spent some time in New York. That's uh, he also spent some time in Southern California. Uh, he's in New York right now. And uh, he was in New York when we recorded this, when we recorded this. It was a great time. And now here's the thing. Tony, I, I just met Tony for this interview, but, but uh, I've been hearing about Tony almost since I started the podcast. Dan Lakin for years was telling me like, dude, you got to get Tony. You got to get Tony, man. You got to get Tony on the podcast. All right, cool. I'll get Tony on the podcast. The folks down at Lemur. Uh, very similarly, or like, yeah, we think Tony would be really good for your podcast, you know? Um, and so this had been a long time in the works to talk to Tony, and Tony was recommended by two very different sources within the base community. And so it was an honor to finally work this out. Um, he had a very busy last year where he was on tour a lot, and so I'm glad it, it worked out for us to, to get together and have a talk here at the beginning of the year before he goes back out with Dylan. Uh, and here it is. Here's my talk with bassist Tony Garnet. Hey. Hey, Tony, you there? Yeah, hold on. Let me just get this full screen here. Oh, I guess I don't have to. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> how you doing? I'm well, man. How you doing? Good. So one of my kids is like sleeping, so. Oh, okay. Teenage boys, right? Oof! How? What? What ages? He's he's gonna be eighteen in like. Oh wow! A few days. Oh crazy! And I have another one, a fifteen year old, but he's with his mother. So. Okay, just the two. And then I have a one year old. Oof! I have one that's gonna be one in like. <laughs> that's crazy. I know. That's so crazy. I have three boys. Man, but most of the time the other two are with their their mother. 18, the 18 year old and the 15 year old. 18 and 15, yeah. Yeah. Do you have kids? No. No, I'm not for it's me. A it's a lot. Yeah, I, I grew up with a big, a big family. Oh yeah. Uh, how many? How many siblings? Oh, there was like eight kids. Oh damn. There was seven boys and and one girl. Wow. Um, I was like second oldest. My, my brother was. Uh, before me, and then my sister was after me. So it was seven boys and one girl. I mean, it was oh. a lot of boys. There's yeah. a lot of boys. It's a rowdy. That's a rowdy household. It's you know, and I was reading about if a family has say a lot of boys, mm -hmm. just the addition of one girl totally changes the whole chemistry. Like gives it kind of, kind of a calming. Right, right. Grounds it a little bit. Right. Yeah, because yeah, with the, the first two boys, me and my ex, we were reading about, it was a book called The Way of Boys. <laughs> the Way of Boys? Yeah, The Way of Boys. Okay. And basically, with boys, they're very energetic, high energy. Yeah. And you kind of, it's like, one of the first things it said, which was good advice, was, you kind of have to let them just tire themselves out. Yeah, yeah just yeah, let them let them run themselves out. So there's a, a lot of you know, I guess a lot of books on, uh, you know, helping with with raising kids and stuff. I don't know how my parents did it, and and my dad's family they all had like eight kids. My dad came from thirteen kids, wow. and they say it's it's actually easier having having one kid is actually kind of hard because it's you don't have another kid to watch him. the one kid yeah. yeah right and and i kind of believe that but with the new baby um it might just be that might be good <laughs> 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 what's your what's your ethnicity it's very mixed yeah just everything yeah okay just, Name something, and <laughs> it's probably in there. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I know I haven't done a, a, a you know DNA test. My sister did, and there's a lot of there's just so many things. Are you interested in it? Um, I mean, I know some of it, but I just um, 
haven't done the research. I haven't done, and I know it's much cheaper now to do. Yeah, yeah. there's so many, kind of, so many services. I think you just for do it. a swab or something, and you could send it in. And it used to be like you know fifteen hundred dollars or something. Now I think you can do a DNA test for a couple hundred, a couple hundred bucks now. Yeah, yeah. So all the maybe I'll do it because if she's done it, they say one. I don't know if any other male in my family has. Any of my brothers have done it. They said, if the girl does it, then w- at least one guy has to do it. Okay. For it to really um, even out, to, for it to make sense. Huh. So, I'll probably do one. Huh? All right. We were, we were born in, in Minnesota, and there's everything but Scandinavian in our blood. <laughs> and my sister did a DNA test, and she found that she had 29% Scandinavian. 29%? We didn't know where that came from. Huh. (laughs) That's bizarre. I know. Yeah. I don't have any Scandinavian relatives. Right. My my aunt that my mom was actually raised by, my uh, my, um, Aunt Ernie, she had a boyfriend named Carl. Uh, this guy was Swedish, pretty pretty old. Okay. Like, I don't know, I guess when you're five years old. <laughs> yeah. Anyone over 30 is old. <laughs> Not even 30. The, anybody in their teens is old. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. So, I think this guy, Carl, he seemed to be like he was 80. Yeah. And he yeah. Had an <laughs> apple farm, and he would bring us these big bushels of ap- apples. So he was Swedish. So I thought, wait, is Carl somehow... Our dad, or your dad. <laughs> but that was just a. That's funny hilarious, thought. man! You got quite the record collection behind you. I know, and actually, I have a lot of records downstairs. I'm, I'm in the upstairs, um, one of the bedrooms here. And yeah, the records I've gotten um, in the last couple of years are are downstairs, which I thought. I don't really need to buy any more records a few years ago, like 10 years ago. Yeah. And now there's been a huge research. There's a research I, like having, yeah. I like having records, but to get, if, if you get a record on eBay or an older record, I mean, there's new records that are really nice, mm-hmm. really great sounding. But if you get a, um, anything that, that was as old and you've had this record for years, and then you replace it with a one that someone really took care of. Because some of my records, I had a bad stylist for a few years, and it okay. really damaged some records. And records do get damaged anyway mm-hmm. when yeah. you replay them. Like when um, you know they, you make a recording, and they I don't know if they still have it, but you get an acetate of of your record, and you can mm. only play it ten times before it's worn out. Oh, I didn't even but know about that. That's how needles work. Okay. But there's a company near me. I just found them recently called uh, Soundsmith. They make a turntable. You could play an acetate a hundred times, and it doesn't damage it. So none of your records would be damaged the way these oh. guys turntables. So I went there because I needed a stylus on my turntable. It had broken, gotten broken off. So I took take my turntable to them. And they show me this turntable that they've made where instead of the weight being on the the tone arm, mm-hmm. there's no weight at all. I don't know how they do it, but it still tracks perfectly. It doesn't hmm. you think, oh, this this is gonna skip. There's no weight. Yeah, yeah. There's no it, there's no wear and tear on the rec. I, I'm not sure how much that turntable is or that, <laughs> or that I'm gonna spend. But they've, these guys have really researched this. It's That's cool. incredible. And uh, yeah, it's called Soundsmith in, um, in Peekskill. And they also um, are part of uh, a charity that um, uh, does these recordings. And they donate the money to uh, a, a charity that is um, kind of helps kids who are basically sold into slavery oh, wow. from all over the globe. And so if you go on their website, Sound, Soundsmith, uh, in Peekskill, New York, you can find all, all the stuff they do with his, uh, their children's charities. So that's, that's my cool. plug. 
<laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's my one charity. That's, uh, that's uh, do, you, do you support the charity? I do. I, yeah. I do. And I didn't know till I went in there to have this turntable. Oh, because, yeah. <laughs> and the guy said, listen, if you're ever interested in, in coming here and doing a, a recording, audio files, love these records. We did one with Bill Frizzell did one. There's oh, been wow. a few people that have done these recordings there. And they're, and so people pay for these recordings. They're very exclusive. And they um, have money to cover the production costs. And then the rest they donate. Oh, that's great. To, to their charity. Yeah, so. Very cool. What, yeah. uh, what are you listening to in your free time? Also, by the way, I haven't said it to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's- hey, Happy New Year. Yeah. <laughs> How, you doing? How was your New Year? New it, was, uh, it was okay. I, this, was the, this was the first year I was off that I didn't have a gig in like 20 years. And uh, I kind of loved it. I kind of loved it. That is so funny because this is the first gig I had in 20 years. Oh, really? <laughs> It's like we're like bizarre world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah New York, LA, right? You got the gig. I don't have a gig. And I started playing New Year's Eve. I grew up in Redondo Beach, right? Okay. After we were in Minnesota. We ended up in Redondo, and uh, it's lovely down there now. What was it like back in the day? It was great. I feel so lucky that we that we yeah really that kind that of whole little up. area like Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. That's all. I love it. It's incredible, uh, and to when I when we first got out there from Minnesota, yeah, to see, to see the Pacific Ocean, and right. the first beach I think I swam at was in Venice Beach, where my uh, aunt was a, a hair cutter. But then we ended up going to Redondo Beach in Hermosa and just seeing the Pacific there. Like you come over this hill, 190th Street Hill, and like the Pacific is like it looks like it's just bubbling out of the earth, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, when I see it now, I still get that that same feeling as when I was ten and saw it for the first time. I still look at the Pacific and go, "Wow, this yeah, is, it's so great." But it is. I never my you know, a couple of my brothers surf. One of my brothers surfs every single day. Oh wow, he's, he's still yeah, out here. Yeah, he, I have a few that are still out there. But the okay. one that surfs, he skateboards. He's doing every everything that you you. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, the whole Southern right. California it's lifestyle. Like being a, a musician or or whatever, a lot of stuff is is centered around being available when the big waves come in. Right, right, right. Whole job is like he works overtime. He works really hard, and he's got, had an agreement with his boss that he would do all this extra work. So when the big swells come in, he can be out there for three days. <laughs> right. I know. Where where was your gig? Where was your New Year's Eve gig? I was in uh, the city, so I'm like an hour and a half from the city. And okay. It was down in Tribeca at a, at a hotel called the Roxy Hotel, a great okay. hotel. And I was playing with uh, um, there's a filmmaker named Abel Ferrara who's done a bunch of movies that I've played on the soundtracks. With his um, composer Joe Dulia, who helped um, start the play with David Johansson and the Buster Poindexter thing and all that. So Abel likes to do gigs every once in a while. Um, and so it was an Abel Ferrara gig at the Roxy Hotel. Okay. Abel, Joey, and the drummer named um, Danny McDermott, guy I've played with a lot, a singer, Paul Hip, who is a great singer and actor, is in a lot of TV and movies and been in Abel movies, played Buddy Holly on Broadway. And so it was it was a fun gig, just right at midnight. We we played from 10 to 11.30, then we played New York, New York at midnight. And when we weren't playing, they were, they had loud, loud music. So yeah, like loud New club York, music. The gig ended and it was, and I'd left my earplugs in a room upstairs. <laughs> and, was, and I'm trying to pack up, just being pounded. Um, but people ha- had a good time, and and it was a fun gig. But I started playing like like you. When we play New Year's Eve, we get more money. Yeah, of course. Been uh, that 
tradition forever. And I started yeah. playing New Year's Eve when I was 14 at this place, yeah. Tony's on the Pier in Redondo Beach. Okay. We were, we were all my whole family pretty much worked there. I think it's still there. And you would start as a dishwasher when you were like, I was 13, started working there. So um, then we started playing New Year's Eve, me and my brother. So my first New Year's Eve gig was like, let's see, how old am I? So like 20, <laughs> 20 years ago. No, <laughs> like, like 1970, right? Right. Quite every New Year's Eve. And then it kind of stopped. Right. right. Like with DJs and um, I don't know, probably more like 30 years ago. So I only played it probably a couple of times in the last 30 years on New Year's Eve. OK. But um, it was a long day. And uh, yeah. But Abel sang uh, a girl, Karen Scuderi and Paul. And so we had three singers and great band. And so it was a lot of fun. Just so. Cool rock and roll and yeah <laughs> whatever just calling yeah. tunes that everybody knew yeah kind okay. of Paul would just start hey this is in g and sing some beatles song or buddy holly or or little richard or jerry yeah, okay Lewis. okay that, something yeah, you can like hear old, your way through or or you yeah, know yeah. I, I i knew that you kind of i grew up playing i know people nowadays grow up playing different way different <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah a whole it's a whole different vibe uh, two things. I pulled up. I pulled up that film director's stuff. He's he's done a ton of movies. Abel Ferrara, yeah, yeah. Like, oh my god! One gosh. of his guys was at the gig. A guy he started doing films with. Uh, the first one I did with Abel was called King of New York. That I was actually in was in nineteen ninety. I see. Yeah. yeah. So I did. Um, Actually you, were, you were in it? You were a well, character we were in playing. it? Buster Poindexter had a scene where we were playing. And oh, you're in the band. You're in the, the on-screen the, band. Like okay. back when, yeah. And then, um, but then I played on um, some of the soundtracks recently. And I, I've missed a few. But when they showed some of his movies uh, a couple of days before, one of them was um, Chelsea on the Rocks, which is about the Chelsea Hotel. Mm. And, and he said on this showing of movies that they just showed the last couple of days, that that got the most amount of press. Really? <laughs> because people were interested in what went on at the Chelsea Hotel and, and Sid and Nancy and all that stuff, right? And so um, that one was just one of those movies where I think we just, there was no real score. That one we kind of just ad-libbed to the, um, scenes oh really that's kind of a I've, cool way to do it i've done before i did that with in fact the first time i did that was to a jim jarmish movie was we had music that john murray had written but there were some scenes that were just ad lib and i had never done that and so hmm. the first one was um down by down by law okay and um that was uh, a couple scenes where you're just watching it and you're just feeling the scene and it takes a couple of takes but you just want to get the um yeah you know match whatever's going on where would you where would you go like who were you what were you trying to lock in with like what character if there's two there characters was one scene i remember where tom waits is on a curb i think in in down by law and he's i forget exactly what happened he came out and he's just kind of a little sad and maybe depressed i forget get exactly because i haven't seen the movie in a while okay but i remember just when um jim jarmus said okay yeah that's it that's that's perfect and but you have to really immerse yourself in this you can people you can tell when when music really doesn't doesn't match a scene if it's way too much yeah. or not quite enough. Not the right emotional content. Not quite enough, but then to overpower it. Sure. A, a scene. But I've I've done that on a, a few occasions where you're just totally ad lib into a scene, or playing the score. And John Lurie had written a lot of of um, music for Down by Law and other things, Mystery Train, um, 
Get Shorty. Okay. Got to play on a lot of soundtracks that John had had written. And but now these Abel things are Abel is a uh, that's all. And it was funny that Jim Jarmusch was at the gig the other night, New Year's oh, Eve. Yeah? I hadn't seen him in a long time. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. So that was great to see him. And um but Abel's movies are different kind of of films where there's a lot of you kind of have to think of um you can interpret some of the scenes in your own way, like songs. Okay. You have to just kind of okay. Well, it's not in your face, like okay, this is what happened. This is what's going on. Like the one we just did, Padre Pio, was at the Venice Film Festival. So I uh, went from I was doing a gig in Denmark, flew to Venice, my first time in Venice, which oh. was <laughs> and then where'd you fly into? There's no. I I live in Venice. There's no airport here. Well, there's Santa Monica, I guess. That's probably no Venice in Italy. Oh, <laughs> now, I don't live what? in that Venice. I don't live That's in that Venice. That's so funny because <laughs> I started talking about Venice in California. Yeah, about... you were talking about Venice. In... <laughs> now I'm talking the... about. Yeah, Venice. In no, that's Italy. a way better Venice. The one you're talking about that you flew to. That's a it's way better Venice. Incredible! It's so great. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I've been to Europe so many times, and I had never been there. And you get, I came from the airport in a taxi. You go over the bridge. Welcome to Venice, and then you get in a water taxi to actually get to Venice. I mean, yeah. you're in, you know. So were you in a were you in a gondola while you're at the film festival? I never I never got in a gondola. I okay, don't, but they're everywhere. I mean, yeah. you see guys in the, in the gondolas taking uh, people everywhere, and that's yeah. it great. Cool. But you look at you're in the water heading to wherever your drop off point is to, get, and then you walk to wherever you're staying, and you're looking at these buildings, and the water is like like here's. Here's the bottom of the building. Here's the water. Yeah, it's yeah, like, just below. And it's crazy. Coming up, and, and it, the first thing I thought is, how do people live like this? This yeah. is incredible. This is so great. Yeah. So fantastic. And one thing that was in Venice was there's an antiquities museum. Hmm. And um, I was... Off this is the most famous square, San Marcos Square, and right off of that, there's a church where they do uh, concerts with period instruments. But a couple blocks away, there's an antiquities museum with of ancient instruments. So I go in this museum, and um, they've got violins and cellos, and there's like an altar with three bases up there. And is the museum specific to Venice? Is it all? Yes, it's a Venetian and Italian instruments. Yeah. Okay. And so I go and I look at you know his instruments behind glass, and then the three basses sitting there on the stage. So I I'm starting to leave, and then I said to the woman, I said that that's an Amati bass. I said that's incredible. I've never seen an Amati bass. There's probably only a few in the world. And mm -hmm. she said. Yes, and the owner of the bases, uh, I said, and usually they're behind glass and they're cracked and, and it's sad. You see instruments that I always think they should be played. Yeah. And I said, it's great just to see them out in the open. And she said, well, thing is, they have to be played like every day, just about. And I go, really? Where do I sign up? Yeah, 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 I, said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, how how could I get to play one? And she says, Well, you're a professional, you're a professional musician. I said, Yeah, I'm a bass player. She said, I can let you up to play them. There was like a rope. Yeah, of course. Roped off, and it was behind this rope, these three basses. She said, I can let you play them. I said, When? She goes, Come back in an hour. Because there was a few tourists in there, too. Okay. Many. Right. So an hour. Later, I came back and she said, "Yes, come up." And I said, "Could you take a picture of me playing?" Yeah, for yeah. a little video. So I played like this mighty bass, and I played these other two beautiful Italian basses, and then um, took some pictures. And the next day, 
Joey Delia, the Abel's composer, and his wife came with me. And I noticed the pictures I took. I'm wearing shorts. And I said, I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm like insulting these bases. Yeah, yeah. I can't. I can't go pictures. out like that. Could you guys take some more pictures of me? Yeah. So I went back and and played and got another a little photo video up video. Yeah. And I said to the woman, um, I said, "Well, I play. I've been in Italy many times, but never to Venice. I play uh, tour Europe a lot with Bob Dylan." And mm-hmm. she's like ton and she practically started melting yeah <laughs> and then um that was the first day the next day when joey was there i said and this is abel ferrara's composer and she, <laughs> she's almost in tears oh yeah <laughs> so great yeah I, I, I forget but i mean you go to italy and there's italian bases yeah they don't let him out of the country anymore anything over a hundred years i think they have a Oh, I didn't oh, know about cool. that. Yeah, paintings, anything. They're holding on. They're, they're I, I kind of respect that. Yeah. Yeah, as long as they're doing a good job preserving it. Well, I'd never heard of someone saying, oh, these bases have to be played. Have to yeah. be played. Yeah, that's, that's rare. <laughs> that's great. So. What was first for you? What was, uh, did you start on upright or did you start on electric? I started on um, clarinet. <laughs> That was my, that was my first. I didn't see that one coming at all. <laughs> that was actually my first. <laughs> and then in Minnesota, then we went to um, guitars because California was, we moved out there in 65 and it was just exploding. With Was it just for drier weather to get out for the family to get out of the snow? My dad was a carpenter, construction okay. worker. And so in the winter, the work would really slow down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And with eight kids, well, we had seven at the time. It, it was tough. Yeah. And the weather was really rough. The snow would just, like the snow they just had in Buffalo, we would get that. Did that, did that impact you where you're at in New York? No, I, mean, we didn't I, get any, I heard we about didn't it. Any. We didn't get any snow, but it's terrible. Like, I don't know how many people died. It's really sad. It was a lot. But Minnesota would get, I remember it being 30, 40 below. I That's mean, thing. below zero was happened every winter, like a bunch of days. Yeah. So to go to California and then the be and see the surf and then the whole music scene out there was just. But, the, but in Minnesota, my mom is, was a piano player and an organist and she took us. Okay. Sing, like, the modern jazz quartet. I remember seeing oh, wow. like seven and Harry Belafonte and seeing um, really great uh, music then. But California was just exploding in six. I mean, where you're at, like Redondo Beach, you know, what are the sixties? Yeah. Oof, what a time! I know. You know, it's like the oh, heyday but- of this whole little. What's going on over here? And and the uh, the wrecking crew stuff was yeah. all over the airwaves, so you were getting all this Beach Boys stuff, and and like a Rolling Stone was big on the radio, and the Beatles, yeah, and all those. I mean, it was top forty music, but it was there was some really awful songs, but there was some pretty good ones, and then yeah. FM radio started happening, so then you started getting. The band and Dan Hicks and Amanda Cody and and all kinds of San Francisco bands, yeah, just everything. And so I was, I mean, you were out here when the Laurel Canyon thing was just going off, right? Yeah, yeah, was that was been a great I mean, time. I wasn't, old, I wasn't old enough to get into any of the clubs, but I had friends. There was a drummer. There was a band called the. Uh, Royal Teens, they had to change their name because there was another Royal Teens. There was <laughs> another band called, you know, bands had, you had to have a name, The Indescribably yeah. Delicious. So both those bands were in Redondo in the South Bay. They okay. played on the Sunset Strip. But yeah. they, they had made it. They were... That was the big time. And both those drummers from that band ended up in the Bay Area when I moved up there to go to school. And I played with, with both those drummers. One was Mark 
Cohen, who ended up playing with um, Tony Joe White and Byron Berline and a lot of people. And the other guy, Evan Zhang, um, ended up helped found a big company called PetSmart. And so <laughs> these guys, he always was Evan and <laughs> still writes and, and sings. Yeah. But these guys were like, when you were when we were like 12 13 and you'd see these guys playing and another guy who i'm in touch with lindsey guerrero had a band with his brothers and you'd see them up on stage and it made you think well maybe i could do that was was that kind of the beginning of of uh jumping into bass getting from guitar to bass yeah when i was like i guess i started guitar when i was 12, me and my older brother, and then we were taking like theory lessons on, on piano and both learning guitar, but just just for a few months before my brother said, hey, why don't you play the bass and we can start a band. <laughs> and I remember going to someone's house and the guy had this like white tender precision bass and to a little kid, it's like, wow, look at that. I mentioned that to my brother recently and I remember that guy, Greg, he had that white Fender bass. He goes, yeah, that guy. He says you, you. I think you took his gig like a year later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. He was so. But it. But, but luckily, I got on the bass because it just immediately was was like my thing. And yeah, within two months of going to the electric bass, my mom made me take up the upright, like mm. in seventh grade. Wow. So I got on the upright in junior high. Got a bass. I think I was able to bring a bass home. Okay. Guy showed me, Mr. Mallory, just showed me some, how to hold the bow. Yeah. But I could read music because I played, had played clarinet and we were reading. My mom could read anything. I, yeah. She could play these old organs in church and just sight read four or five lines I, I was i was it was crazy when i'd watch her play the organ and play the bass pedals yeah yeah, yeah she could she was just a incredible musician and my dad always sang sang opera oh wow but uh so we were always we were made to really learn to read and sure. not that I'm a great great reader but i could read playing school orchestra and then they had a uh, stage man at the high school. So back then, this is 1968, 69. There's no upright bass players. Guys yeah. are playing either. There's no kids like my age playing upright bass. Sure. Nobody in my whole area. So I would go from the junior high to the high school. In high school, I would go to the junior college and play. <laughs> you had all the school gigs. <laughs> I had all the gigs. <laughs> Playing, you know, with the orchestras or the um, Broadway shows they put on at, at El Camino. And then I was playing on the street a lot with guys showed me um, bluegrass and jug band music. And, okay. Um, trying to, I was listening to some jazz, but mostly playing uh Everything playing with my brother and basically electric bass, playing um, rock bands, playing like Cream and Hendrix and okay. stuff like that. And people in Redondo Beach, there was a lot of cool musicians in Redondo that we played with. So I kept kept really busy. Your, yeah. Does your brother still play? He just retired from playing recently. He has a jazz radio program that he does in. in oh, uh, awesome. Louisiana and Lafayette, yeah. Oh, very and, cool. Oh, he's he's always been uh, he's been in Louisiana for for years, uh, involved at the university, and um, but he played Zydeco music and okay. music, and so he's deep in the Louisiana culture of it all. Really deep. Yeah, I mean, who writes on the family text? He's always writing these things in French. So I'm going, <laughs> that that? not French, but like Creole French. Right, old, right, like the street French. French. Oh, he's he really delved into all the stuff down. So he played with these Zydeco and Cajun bands, and he really knows 
a lot of the historical things that that happened with hundreds of years ago. Yeah. He's, but he does a jazz radio program. His name's Dejama. Okay. Uh, and he's a um, very knowledgeable guy, but he had to, he quit touring a couple of years ago because... Um, Who was he touring with? He was touring with a band. The last band he played with was a band called Jeffrey Brassard and the Creole Cowboys. And they're a great Zydeco band. And he was in a band called Feely before that. But there was a old a fiddle player named Canray Fontenot, who was like one of the last um, of this style of fiddle, okay. creole, creole fiddle. And so my brother was um, friends with Canray and was actually a pallbearer at his funeral. Oh, wow. Canray was recording in the 20s. And Feely even went on tour. He went on tour with Feely, and my brother roomed with Canray. So if if anyone knows about this style of music, and you mention Canray Fontenot, they, they just, their eyes glaze over. Wait, your, your brother knew Canray? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so it's, it's stuff that's, it relates to country music and yeah. You know, Deep, you know, regional stuff. Sure. Oh, but what were some big influences on you? Oh, oh I want to tell you. Oh, also, yeah. Go ahead. My brother Dijon. Not only does he play fiddle, he would play great guitar on any of these bands and bass. Oh, so wow. He's, upright, upright, and electric. He never played upright bass, but okay. He started playing violin when he was five in Minnesota, and wow. he ended up. My brother went on tour when he was nine. Or ten. My my mom flew him to Mexico, and he joined a mariachi band from Monterey, Mexico. Wow! And, and they toured the whole U.S. So when they got to Minnesota, my mom sent me to Duluth or somewhere to get on their bus. It was a priest, Father Alvarez, and it was orphans. Uh huh. They were called Mariachi Infantil, something like that. So I go to somewhere, jump on their bus, just to ride with, just so my mom, I guess, would get rid of me. Yeah, but the, what was this, you for know, like the summer went, or something? Yeah, it was the summer. Okay, so yeah. Their bus for like She's not going to send you on camp. She's just going to send you on tour with the mariachi band. We, we, would, we would go to camp one year. I went to a farm a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> just, it, was, it was such Literally a Literally farming you out. She really knew how to do yeah. things for us to do. So... I end up on this bus with these mariachis, and these guys were incredible. It was so just great. And my brother, who played fiddle in this mariachi band, they had like two or three trumpets. They had, I don't know how many violins, guitaron. Yeah. Uh, this folklorical dancing, girls with the, those kind of dresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a clown, which is... Really? The, the mariachi thing. You got a guy doing like funny dances. I didn't know that. And they have singers um, that will do this drunk thing. You know, the drunken singer. Okay. This mariachi thing. I, I remember with Charlie Sexton, we were in Guadalajara once and we went to a bar called the, the mariachi. And I said, but it was really great. I mean, this is the top mariachi. And mariachi music is beautiful. I, I love it. And these guys are so good. And I said, they do this drunk thing every once in a while. And the very next song, the guy's like, ooh, <laughs> like <that. laughs> and it's it's just it's beautiful. And my brother went on tour really when he was nine. So That's hilarious. And I learned mariachi. And now I still listen to mariachi music and it's just very emotional for me. That's cool. Do you, do you understand? Like, do you speak Spanish? No, I don't understand. You I mean, just hear it as melody lines. Yeah, I've looked yeah. up the, the um, translations. Okay. Of some of the songs like La Negra and, and, you know, the real famous songs. And, I'm, and I love a lot of mariachi music. Like the guy Vincente Fernandez, he just died a couple of years ago. He was like one of the real kings. And he came to New York and filled the garden, apparently. Really? I didn't know about him until 15 years ago. And so um, 
I've seen old black and white clips of of Vincente Fernandez um, that are just it's just amazing. And um, what I loved about it, it's just emotional. It's very emotional music. Mm-hmm. Like we did uh, a tour with with Bob Los Lobos, okay, early, like ninety one or something. And we were in Guadalajara, and after the gig, there was a party. And I could hear a mariachi band, and uh, um, the one of the promoters, the girls. I said, "Are you gonna?" I said, "There's a mariachi band." She she says, "Yeah." I said, "Oh, I'm gonna." I said, "Are you gonna go listen?" She goes, "No, I I cry when I hear it." <laughs> <I'm going. laughs> it's it's so sad. But those guys, Caesar and and David Hidalgo and Conrad, they were playing with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've sat in with the mariachis. So are they, all these are all these tunes kind of tragedies? Like, is that why? Is or is it just emotional? Are they sad, or is it just like really passionate? No matter what the message, they're they're sad, but they're love songs, and they're okay. and in the mariachi bars, they'll sing every every pop song will be played like a mariachi. Yeah, style. yeah. But it's just like the way the the fiddles and the sound of of the trumpet and the that singing style is kind of a forlorn um right it's kind of that way even with um norteño music norteño music i remember i played a little bit with flaco jimenez years ago with peter rowan doing mm-hmm. bluegrass and then doing flaco stuff and a lot of those norteño songs are sad because it's about what's still going on people trying to come over the border right 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 for work they're over here, but then they missed their families back home, and then they're going to get arrested and end up in jail. And it's so it's a lot of a lot of tragic, yeah, a lot of tragic songs. <laughs> but it's beautiful, beautiful music. Do you write? Um, a little bit. I, I've I've written some um, things. I mean, I used to write more, but I'm trying to um, finish some um, a documentary right now. That really. I'm, Really? So that's like that's more like <clears throat> I mean writing is composing, but I don't write lyrics. I have I've never been a lyric writer. Okay, but you're you're doing all the music right now. You're doing the you're working on the music for a documentary. Yes. What's the premise of the documentary? Well, I don't want to say because it's been going on for a while. Okay. It, it's it, I should be finishing with it soon. So. Okay. Is it uh like a pop culture thing or a politic thing or like just what's kind no. of the, the no, scope it's, of it? It's, no, it's more. I don't really want to. Okay, okay, no, I, I get it. <laughs> I, I'm actually involved in like a, a number of projects right now that I can't discuss. You can't talk about it. All. <laughs> okay. I can only discuss about stuff like yeah, I that's have, already um, out in the world. I mean, I have some cool stuff coming up, and then the, the I think the uh, the Bob tour is um, Bob Dylan tours. We've been doing this last record, Rough and Rowdy Ways, and that's been really great. And so that's... You were on the road for a good part of last year, right? Yeah, we started back in last November. Yeah. And um, did uh, probably 100 shows in, over the course of the year. But we, we were off for like two months, three months at a time. Yeah. We'll go out and really do a bunch of shows. and Right, you really hit it hard while you're out there. Weeks. Four yeah. or five weeks. So How did now, it feel going back on the road, pulling that many dates after the lockdown and there was no dates and you're home and everybody? I know for me, like I got really comfortable being at home and I became more of a homebody. And now just the idea of really leaving is a little bit more daunting. Like, yeah, dad, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to leave the house. I don't want to be away, the, things like that. How How did it feel for you? After not touring for that year, going back out and pulling a hundred plus states. Um, well, it was good to to be out and it, um, I mean, the thing about doing the lockdown, I was able to figure out how to record myself and send yeah, it, yeah, 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 and start doing this film music stuff and and practice. I, I never True. really get to practice. And there was a few gigs, so it was fun to practice and go play a few gigs here and there. But then to go on tour with Bob and to see the people who really wanted to to hear music, yeah, yeah. 
and yeah, see around it again and yeah it was incredible sure. it was it was so great just to just to be out and play it still is because people were coming to the shows and most of the shows are selling out i think they're yeah. all selling out and the reviews are really great and this is a new record that people don't do tours and do the whole record <laughs> they're right, new right. Record. They wanna, <laughs> hey we want to hear some old songs and yeah so this is all new material on this record like the record we recorded yeah a couple of years ago cool and so to play like nine of those songs and then yeah. maybe four or five of the older oh wow it's pretty it's pretty brave because yeah. when you see acts that have been around for a long time people want to hear their their yeah, old. the old stuff like yeah. just the old stuff yeah and bob has never really done that we played i played a lot of his older songs but then um people want to hear him like the record and he's never done, done him like the record anyway so right right so it's, uh it's when, did, when did you get when you came out here and you were in redondo beach uh when did you make the move back to new york i um moved to the bay area to go to school uh, okay your high school i went up to to berkeley i went okay. to cal and in the Bay Area, I started playing all kinds. There was so much music there. This is 1973. Yeah. So there had greatest bluegrass bands, great jazz, Bobby Hutcherson, people like that, John Handy. They had all that East Bay. Yeah. Punk stuff. Power, Power, and Larry Graham, and, um, and then the San Francisco bands. And bands like Azteca and, and um, Charlie Musselwhite, blues guys. It's just incredible music. Everywhere, everywhere you turn, there was just great music. So I got to school and immediately was on academic probation, <laughs> like the first quarter, because I was out playing. Right. So, so I go to, so I play with this band, this bluegrass band. I mean, I'm playing on the street. I can't really play in the bars because I'm 17 or, or okay. 20. No, I was 17, I guess. And then in May of that year, I turned 18. But I'm 17, right? I can't play in any bars. I'm playing on the street. But I play this with this bluegrass band in Santa Cruz, and we open for Ramblin' Jack Elliott and the band Asleep at the Wheel. Okay. I heard of Asleep at the Wheel. And then so I see him for the first time after this bluegrass band from the hog farm, <laughs> wavy gravy and all those, right? So we <laughs> all for Asleep at the Wheel. And I just thought, well, this is incredible. They're playing bluegrass country stuff and swing. Yeah. I'm at Berkeley playing jazz in their jazz department. And there's some great players there. There's a woman piano player named Susan Muscarella who's started the California Conservatory of Jazz now. She's the president. Oh, wow. A combo with her, a great drummer named Kim Plainfield, um, a sax player and, and a trumpet player. And we we go to this jazz uh, festival at in Van Nuys, and we make it to the finals. Out of 100 schools, we're like one of the five combo finalists. And the judges are like, like Phil Woods. Right. Uh, Clark Terry. The New York, New York heavies. Blair Fisher, yeah. But yeah. They're, all, they're all in LA now. But, right? Yeah, yeah. West Coast. So and Frank Rossellino. And they're the judges. So we we did good. But I was in the Berkeley in that jazz department. Frank Rossellino, man, that guy, what a sad story. What happened with him? I uh let me make sure this is the right guy. I think he was the guy who wrote the standard Blue Daniel that shot himself. Oh, he wrote sure. Blue, Dan Blue Daniel is such a beautiful it's song. A great song. Uh, that's, that's the guy I'm thinking uh, of. Right? Ba -da 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 -ba -da -ba -da -da. Yeah. I got Phineas Newborn playing. Oh. Right? Is that Blue Daniel? Yeah, I think so. Um, wow. I want to, I think that's the right thing. I'm trying to look this up quick. I don't know. I'll let you know. Well. Uh, or it could be a different Frank. I know it was anyway, a he was the, she was one of the judges. Okay. And so I 
So I so I ended up joining Asleep at the Wheel six months later. Yeah, so the, quickly, he did. He shot both of his sons while they were asleep. One died. Uh, the other one survived but was blind, and then he shot himself. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's how that's how he went. That's how he went out. Pretty I never dark. knew that because Frank Vassalino was also involved <laughs> with stuff that like Scotty LaFaro did. Mm. Right? I think they he might have played with Scotty. Um, Scotty was there with Richie. I'm looking at Luca. his discography right now. I don't know if they ever recorded together, but I just found out recently Scotty LaFaro, you know, he did a lot of his woodshed and really playing was where I grew up at the lighthouse. He played uh, here, with, yeah. Yes, in Hermosa yeah. Beach. Because I used yeah. to go to the lighthouse when I was you could get in the lighthouse. That wasn't um uh you didn't have to be twenty one. Cool so, place. Yeah. So apparently Scotty played there a bunch. Yeah. In the, the book that his sister wrote about him. Um, yeah, there's a there's a gentleman uh, on the podcast. He's a London guy that coming through the states, like met with LaFaro's sister and got to go to her house. And the sister showed uh, Dave Swift where LaFaro used to practice, and Dave Swift was involved with that that book that came out, uh, Shades of Jade, a few years back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that book. That book yeah. is so great. She did such a great job. Yeah, and I think that was the recording. Was that the recording with uh, like these interviews with Bill Evans talking about how him and LaFaro would practice or a recording of him and LaFaro practicing? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my favorite. The recording of them doing... Uh, like talking through I, what they're going to do. My Foolish Heart. There's a yeah, long yeah, yeah. Recording, uh, practicing that and playing the changes and and I just, um, yeah, I love what Sky LaFaro did. And, and the fact, like, a guy like Phil Palumbi, right, did all those yeah. solos of Scotty's, right? It's, it's amazing. I mean, he he really achieved something. And the best, there's some great parts of that book. One of them, the first one is Don Thompson in the forward, right? Does everyone want it to be Ray Brown? Which... Right. I still think Ray is still the king. He's the overall king of upright bass as far as I I'm, I'm concerned. Okay. Right, because I mean I'm not I'm not going to disagree. I think I think Ray became the standard of what yeah. it means to be, but yeah. I I think that there's some guys that are equally uh of that caliber, you know, uh George DeVivier, I think, gets overlooked. I think Sam Jones gets overlooked. Yeah, PC Sam gets Jones. some attention, but PC was the most recorded guy of the time. And I never got to see uh, Paul Chambers, and I probably listened to him even more than Ray Brown, but I loved all those Ray Brown Oscar records. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah. going to see Ray as a kid, and um, I didn't get to see Leroy Vinegar, but when Ray would just... I'm not talking about solos, what a bass player is doing as far as backing up someone playing, just walking bass. Sure. When you would see Ray just w walk the bass, it was just prophetic. I, I never saw, and I've never seen anyone who could do that. And mm -hmm. guys that, that I've, like I never really studied, studied with anyone. I'm mostly self-taught, but I, I got a lesson from Ray once. Oh, wow. I got a lesson from Dave Holland. Mm -hmm. One time I said, so Dave, well, who do you listen to? And he goes, I still go to listen to like Ray Brown. <laughs> so <laughs> both guys I talk to, Ray is still to me the top guy. Even though, so as far as just your doom go, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. guys like George Mraz, who I yeah. just flipped over, Michael Moore, I studied with, yeah. who's just a monster. And there's so Did many. Did you great study with Mraz? I took a lesson from George. Okay. He was because I saw him at Bradley's when I first moved to New York. Mm -hmm. He wasn't a great teacher, but like the way he played, I think he was probably the one of the greatest bass players ever. Mm. You think? George? I do. I'm a big fan of George Moraes' playing. And there's a, um, it's very much, you know, like he does not do, he plays the tradition of jazz wonderfully. But you always yeah. hear this European thing in there also. 
And I really like that in his play. Yeah. He's, he's just, he was such a monster. I remember seeing him with uh, Dizzy Gillespie at the, mm. no, Dizzy's 75th uh, birthday or something. It was a month at the Blue Note. And he had a different rhythm section every week. So I go to see a week that George is playing bass. And they did um, Hot House or some pretty up tempo. And George takes out the bow and he wouldn't bow that much. But man, he took this bowing solo where I was just falling on the floor. Yeah. And he was, I really liked George so much. He was just played perfectly in tune. He had yeah. such incredible chops. But he told me Oscar, when he went out with Oscar, Oscar wanted him to play like Ray when it came to. Oh, just doing time. that thing. Yeah. He said, you got to dig in more. Oh, I don't know. And George said he had blood blisters on his yeah. fingers. <laughs> he, he called Oscar. One afternoon and said, he says, I have a fever in my fingers. I have blood blisters. Because Oscar wanted everyone like, I mean, that Ray thing was so strong. Sure. And he's, and Oscar said to George, okay, George. Um, okay, so then for the matinee, you don't have to wear a tux. That was, <laughs> that was Oscar. That was the... That was the courtesy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. But so what I was going to say in, in Helene's book, she says, Don Thompson says, everyone wanted to be Ray Brown until Scotty LaFaro came along. <laughs> and Ray's sitting there going, at some point in the book going, and they're going, don't you think this is too much? And Ray goes, I like what this guy's doing. And then when he died, when Scotty died, Ray said, this is going to set bass playing back 10 years or something like that, right? So, yeah. but I mean, I, I've gotten to see like Ron Carter with a bunch of different people. And, and there's so many great bass players in New York that I've gotten to see once I moved here. So I I joined this band of sleep as well, moved to Austin for five years. Okay. And then I moved to New York at the end of 78 really to concentrate on playing jazz oh interesting but it was um because i would go to hear bill evans every night at the vanguard if i was on tour and came to new york i would run to bradley's i would run to the vanguard i'd run to the jazz emporium mm -hmm. uh boomers see dave holland see all these richard davis sunny okay. Stitt, dexter oh, yeah, yeah yeah all these guys were, t I went to the cookery to meet Mary Lou Williams because my mom oh, wow. knew her and I was going up to play with her in her apartment and went up there a few times. And But the first time I met her, she's playing at the cookery. And so I wait till her break and then I go over to her table and I said, Mary Lou, I'm Peggy Bernier's son. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, New York. We can always use bass players. Um here, sit down. This is Charles Mingus. <laughs> so I meet what? Mingus. Yes. <laughs> so I was going. Oh my up, gosh. I know. So I'm going up to Barry Lou's and, and then um I was playing, you know, some pretty cool things. Not just getting my feet wet with the jazz scene. And then um I got a call from this singer Robert Gordon, Rockabilly singer, and he says, Hey, uh Bruce Springsteen's bass player gave me your name. I need an upright guy who can play slap bass. And I could kind of do that. Okay. I go up there and he's got this big tour. I end up doing, um, playing with Robert. And then I would come back to New York and play some jazz here and there, but never really um, got to really delve as much as I wanted to and and i still don't i mean i still do some jazz stuff I, i've done some stuff with like diana qual played on a couple of her records and oh she's so great because she, she'll sing and then she plays these yeah great solos and she's just swinging it's yeah like, it's all got a really nice laid back feel and the record i played on with her she had uh, what's his name uh, the Kareem Riggins, who was Ray Brown's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so 
So anyway, I get to play a little bit of jazz. I was with a quartet with a sax player named Rob Sheps, who's a great saxophone player. And so um, I don't get to play as much as, as I want. And I never really was able to make a living solely as a as a jazz player. But um, the guys who, who do that, there's just such monster players. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know what it's like in New York. I've never played out there uh, other than doing some tours that went through New York. So I've never been on the New York scene, but it's got to be rough, you know, of all the young guys that are coming out of these major schools yeah. and uh, everybody's such a strong player. And every year there's probably a new batch. You well, know? When I moved here, there wasn't, the school thing was not as strong. Now it really is. But now there the school were guys thing who, is big deal, who were yeah. just playing who knew every song. Right? <laughs> like I, I saw this thing with Michael Moore, this interview, and he said, yeah, you were expected to know every song. He goes, if a sax player sits in, he's going to call his song. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to know that. And so right. you try and find it. And a couple of times I was asked by like John Burr, great bass player. Yeah. He's playing at Bradley's with somebody. And he says, oh, you want to sit in? And I'm like, oh, I'm not quite ready. I don't, I don't know. And John <laughs> Burr was a monster player. And, um, but like, Guys, like, if you got on a gig with Jimmy Rolls, right? Who knew every song, everything, yeah. I mean, there's a video of Oscar Peterson. Uh, Oscar Peterson had a show in Canada and he has Jimmy Rolls on. And he says, Okay, Jimmy, Jimmy uh, people say you know all these songs. And Michael Moore told me, he says, Yeah, we're asking Jimmy, just can you get a book together of your songs? And Jimmy was a big help to J- Diana Qual. Okay. And so she knew Jimmy and Michael, they were trying to get Jimmy to get his songs in a book because he would just start playing. And a lot of these gigs, that's what guys do. They don't even call the song. They just start. Start going into it, yeah. Playing. And Ron McClure was my first teacher in the Bay Area. Okay. I saw an interview with him and he says, that's what you would do. You'd be on the thing. A guy would start playing the song and you would have to know what it is. And yeah. They would tell you the, the yeah, title yeah. of the song. And that's what was expected. And the bass players had to know every song. Right. And so, man, it's it's tough. But they don't do that anymore. People have their have their songs and they don't know a million. And Jimmy Rolls on this Oscar show, Oscar says, you know more songs than anyone. Well, I don't know. And he really did. And he goes, including the verses, mm. and, and which is true. Jimmy did know that. And Oscar says, Mike, do you know the verse of this song? And he starts playing a song. He goes, oh, oh, that one I don't know. And Oscar's like, okay. And he goes, is it this? And he starts playing and the play, verse. And you play it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's beautiful. So those kind of piano players are, are not really around. Right. Or that new millions and millions of songs. Yeah, I play with one guy that knows a ton of material. And uh, we were both in the house band at a jam session together. And that became the game of the jam session, trying to stump this piano player. And nobody could do it. Really? Yeah, nobody could stump him. Like, he knew everything. He knew wow. everything we called. Wow. Where do you play at, mostly? Um... Since the world opened back up, I uh, I don't as much anymore. I do some like <clears throat> fly dates and things with a trumpet player on the what west were you coast. Doing before, before, oh, anything, just just working guy stuff, like you know, whatever, uh, singer songwriter thing at hotel cafe or a, a top forty cover thing at a hotel or whatever jazz club, like whatever. So when you were playing jazz club, so were you playing with? People who would they have music or would they just start playing? Um, I don't know. Sometimes it would be original material where you'd show up and they'd have charts or you know send out PDFs for people to put on an iPad or something. Yeah. Um, Singers usually have their book of tunes they do with their key, and then if it's just like a quartet, 
they just call tunes and someone will start something that we all probably know. And uh, no one's really calling a tune at that right. point. I guess the roughest time I had was I was playing with Ted Curson, you know, who played trumpet with Mingus. Mm-hmm. At the Blue Note, he had these jam sessions after the regular shows at the Blue sure. Note. One. And I, I, I don't know if they still have those, but you get up there and play and, and a singer would come up then and different horn players and he'd basically play for two or three hours. And I did that for um, a few months and it was great. I learned a, a lot of songs, but it was like intimidating when someone wants some weird song in like a weird key. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, man, doing those kind of like power sets must have got your chops together. Like just your really stamina yeah. must, have, must have been amazing. Yeah, and playing with, uh, what was another guy I played with? A guy named Willis Jackson, who kind of discovered Pat Martino. Okay. But Willis Jackson and Jack McDuff were, and Willis was also married to Ruth Brown. So I played with him a lot at this place called the West End. Okay. Um, cafe and uh, a few things here and there, but I started playing a little more electric bass in the early 80s. I was always playing more upright and then got to New York and realized, oh, I guess I got to, I got to play more electric. So I started. That's an interesting time to be in New York with an electric bass. I mean, that's the, that's the Jocko era of things. Yeah. And so I started concentrating more on playing electric. Now I, I still, I think I've always been more of an upright player, Mm -hmm. but, but then I started playing more electric bass and I would play with, um, I remember playing one of the first guys that really scared me was Dr. John. Mm. Uh, playing a gig with him was with, with um, see who was the guitar player. Um, oh, I forget his name. Anyway, really heavy New York players, horn players, everyone, and and Mac had his music. He had a book of his songs, but I knew. Page and music and Zydeco and some New Orleans stuff, Fats Domino, but I didn't know the New Orleans funk thing. I, I didn't really know the meters. No, okay. Like 81. That really was never a thing I had studied and played. Yeah. So, and Mac, that's what he does. And so he gets up there and he starts playing. I, first of all, it's the Lone Star Cafe. So it takes him 10 minutes to get down to the stage and we're just vamping on. Ico, right? Don't do yeah. but then he comes on and he starts playing ding 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 ba ding ding Ico I and you just hold on. Yeah. And he was so great. He was so good and just so soulful. And then he does this song, uh, he's got so many great songs, but one song he did was a hit record for him, Such a Night. So in Such a Night, he does a solo thing in the middle of it. You know, such a night, and he's and I've never seen him do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I never had seen him play. I'm like playing on a gig with him, and he goes into the when I mean, we'd rehearse. He says, "I'm going to do this solo thing, and then I'll bring you all in." So he starts doing the solo piano thing, and I had never heard a piano played like that. It was just scary. And I'd seen lots of great jazz players, sure, right? sure. But, you know, loved Oscar and Ray stuff and Bill Evans. I'd see every night at the Vanguard. Dr. Johnson is playing this New Orleans thing, this solo, and I wanted to run from the stage. I, was, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to be here. I'll, I'll be in the dressing room. Yeah, that's crazy. It, it just scared me to death. He was yeah. so, and so I started playing more electric, and then I uh, started playing a lot of blues at at tramps playing with otis rush i got to play with albert collins um play with even with escarita who was an influence of little richard okay and um there was a lot of like bo diddley Mm -hmm. played with chuck berry all those guys who would use pickup bands yeah 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 and now they're they're gone i mean they would have bands at for certain periods of time but in new york they knew they could come in get good players and sure. so i got to play with solomon burke and oh wow so many irma thomas and it was just um 
Amazing. Yeah, what was it? There was like I forgot I when it was. They have this thing on on Dionne Warwick on CNN right now, and I was watching it. I was like, "Wow!" So she really crossed over. Uh, she could do, and I remember playing with Dionne Warwick. It was a um, tribute to Nancy Wilson. Okay. And then she said, and they were talking about Ashford and Simpson talking about her, and I got to play with them. I mean, there was so many cool people to to play with and i had moved to new york to play jazz but then i found this whole other scene lots of other stuff that um where i could eat yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right you know, i right. was just never at that caliber as far as a, a jazz player where i really stuck to it and just made a go of just playing jazz but i'm glad i got to play more electric and meet Jocko, lend him this bass uh -oh, here. Uh oh, uh so, oh. Jocko, I lent this bass. Oh yeah? This is, a, <laughs> this is a precision, right? A 65, right? Okay, 65 that has, the, uh, that has the mute on it, the dampener down by the bridge. Yeah, I always put that on yeah. my bass. So, and, and I, you know, I use pretty heavy, like, action, like James jamming big, Okay, you get the big sound. So Jocko needed a, um, I don't use this bass that much, but it's, so Jocko needed a bass with playing with Mike Stern, and I go to, I was playing with Lenny Stern, and I go to their house, and Mike goes, oh, let's play. You want to play something? Waiting for Lenny. Okay, now let's play this. It's like, she was playing so fast. So I tried to play with him, but I played with Lenny a couple of gigs at this place, 55 Christopher. Yeah. They're just closed now. So Yeah, that's been, uh, what was it, like four or five months ago, the 55 yeah. bar closed? So Jocko needed a bass there one night with Mike Stern. So I said, okay. And I forget. What, what year are we talking? Like, is this in the is this in the peak of his uh, it be, unraveling? Yeah, it might be 84. Or oh, like, yeah, okay. Eight. I was some maybe yeah when I, you did all those punk jazz records there uh, with Stern, I don't remember. I don't remember exactly, but so I bring in my precision and I brought in my polytone amp. I lent him amps, bass. So he takes this high axe action precision, and he's the one of the first things they do is Donna Lee, and he yeah. does the Donna Lee thing yeah. like on his first record on this bass, <laughs> like it's his jazz bass. But right. for like, but for like ten minutes or eight minutes, he soloed yeah. on this bass. That's crazy. Which is high action. Yes, I mean he was he was such a uh, monster player. It was yeah, so yeah, good yeah. to be able to see someone like that. That's cool. But he was out. It was just it was sad. And yeah. his um, drinking and and whatever took over because then. He couldn't even get in. They wouldn't even let him in. I'd walk. I remember walking around with him in the village once, and they wouldn't let him into the bottom line. And I was playing there a lot with with Buster Point. And I said to the manager, "They go, he can't come in." And I go, "Jocko." And they go, "We know who it is. No, he can't come in." They wouldn't let him in the Bradleys, the Lone Star. At the bottom line, I said, "No, it's Jocko. We know who it is. Okay, you stay with him if he gets out of line." Yeah. And it was Bobby Bland playing and Jock. Okay. As a, hey, like, so I buy him a drink, which I don't know why. <laughs> hey, Bobby, it's Jocko. And they and they make us leave. And they go, he's got to go. We were only there for five minutes. Just did, the, then, did he harass Bobby or was that it? He was just because just he started yelling. They thought, okay, it's, it's just going to get. Oh, worse. it's going to escalate. Yeah. He's disrupting the show. So yeah. then when that Milkowski book came out, I read that's where his showcase was for that record for bobby columbia right was at the bottom line oh really and i thought this is like bird not being allowed in Birdland. yeah yeah yeah. kind of right yeah i understand the parallel wow i didn't know that like i haven't this, read that book in who knows 15 years this is maybe maybe i didn't maybe i didn't read it in the book maybe i saw it in that documentary i anyway. thought i thought I remembered that when he went to go uh, 
audition or showcase for the guys of Columbia Records that was at Columbia Records because the dude from Columbia was hitting on his wife. And oh, Jocko's okay. wife was like, no, I'm married to the best bass player. And then the record guy was like, cool, have him come by my office if he's so great. And just showed up with no shoes and a bass and <clears throat> you did the oh, Jocko yeah, thing. I, I just remember seeing somewhere about him playing at the, at bottom, the bottom line. And that was helped get his record here, or maybe it was his first real showcase after hmm. the record came out. Because the bottom line was a great listening club. Really? Yeah, it was incredible. There was uh, I saw some great, great acts there, and there was almost every seat. Sometimes you couldn't see so well, but yeah, here every every seat you could hear so well in the bottom line. Oh man. I saw Sonny Rollins at the bottom line. I saw George Jones at the bottom line. <laughs> Damn. It was like, they really... George Jones, like country George Jones? Yes. Wow. He played the bottom line. <laughs> That's funny. I, I wouldn't expect uh, George Jones and Sonny Rollins to be doing the same clubs. I know. Yeah. But, but you know, back then, because Bob t- Dylan talked about when they would play like the Village Gate, I think shows were going like all day and they'd have, he said he would play and then like Cecil Taylor would play. Really? After. So even on the same day. <laughs> was the Village Gate a venue or was that yeah. that newspaper that was kind of going around the village in the, like the early 60s? What was the name of that newspaper? The Village Voice? Ah, that's what it was. Okay, yeah. That's where you found out where everyone was playing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That was voice. great. That was so great. Yeah. I mean, that's better than anything you can find online now. Sure. Because well, because it's all in one place. <laughs> I mean, that's what's so great about one publication versus was, like a yeah. billion publications, and you don't even know which one to follow anymore. That's how you got apartments. Yeah. That's how you got everything, the Village Voice. But the Village yeah. Gate was a venue on Bleecker Street that, would have um, comedians. Okay. Right? Like um, George Carlin, people like that. They'd have Odetta, um, all the folk, all the folk people would play there and all the jazz people. Yeah. And they would just take turns. There'd be not one jazz night. And then when I moved to New York, the Village Gate had the Latin meets jazz. Okay. Right? And they'd have, Latin bands with some great soloists, Michael Brecker, Randy Brecker, yeah. or uh, Steve Ture, all these great jazz players would go play while people were dancing. Latin, I mean, unbelievable Latin dancing. Right. With these great Latin bands playing, where a jazz guy would solo, would get up and just blow like it was the vanguard. Right. It was in front of a Latin band. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was happening when I moved to New York. I, there was one bass player I loved. I think it was Venezuelan named Oscar de Leon. Oh, yeah. Oscar, okay. Oscar de Leon would play, and he'd play some of his stuff's on YouTube, old Oscar de Leon. And he'd play baby bass, and then he'd dance. And he had the greatest dance moves and sing. Oh, and, wow playing with this really complicated rhythmic stuff to the, you know, to, to the clave. Yeah. And I loved it. I've never seen anyone do that. Esperanza, I saw her that she can do that. Okay. Sing. Okay. <laughs> yes, she's oh, well, singing, okay. like playing off yes. the clave like that. Well, playing singing, bass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's why she's who she is, because I've seen her play with, I always thought, Oh, yeah, she plays. I've heard of her. Yeah, she's. Oh, yeah, this girl looks. And I, the first time I saw her play was with Bobby Hutcherson at the Vanguard playing okay. like Bobby's thing. Bobby's oh, really? Thing. Yes. That's wow. and Like I went, super high octane. And just modal and really ex- just harmonically not bebop. Right, right. Uh, really modern like the way Bobby Hutcherson plays, the way his songs are. Because, you know, when Bobby Hutcherson played a play, a guy played with Mike Clark, drummer played with um, uh, 
Harold Land, right? Harold mm-hmm. Land played with Bobby Hutchison later on. Harold Land went from playing the Clifford Brown, Max Roach stuff, which is real hard bop, right? Yeah, sure. Completely uh, changing his his sound and leaping ahead into the more new newer jazz thing. And Mike Clark said he thought he was going to be playing with Harold Land. This is back in the mid '60s, or he thought he'd be playing more of a bebop thing. And Harold Land played more like later Coltrane stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Esperanza playing with Bobby Hutcherson, I opened my eyes. I went, "Wow, this girl really she can play." Yeah, she great. Yeah. Uh, Tony, what uh, what do you got coming up the rest of the year, man? Uh, yeah, you're in you're in town for a little while before you go back out on the road. Yeah, I have uh, some gigs coming up. The singer I used to play with Robert Gordon uh, okay. a couple months ago, and so did we had this cool tribute coming up for him um, and the guitar player I played with. Who I when I moved to New York, not only did I learn about playing jazz, but also playing rock and roll. I had never really played. I was coming from country and Western swing and playing a little jazz, but I had never really played real rock and roll. I, and yeah. As a kid in high school, I played it. But so this guitar player, Chris Spedding, with Robert Gordon, who was a, Chris Spedding was a session player in, in London, like Jimmy Page and, and people like Pete Townsend, all respected Chris Spedding. And I learned to play a lot with Chris, just how to really approach rock certain type of okay I mean, I chuck berry chuck berry i learned playing with chuck berry so <laughs> chris, chris showed me things that like it I, i've used them forever and yeah. so i'm gonna do a tour with him and anton fig great oh, nice. yeah, sure. coming up so we got some shows coming up and then i gotta go do a, a record uh in Jamaica, that um, I'll tell it. I'll tell you about it when I when it's oh, done. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, you, get, you guys, is that one of the projects? One of the yeah non disclosure projects. And then um, let's see what else. Then some other stuff that I I can't talk about. And then I think Bob will go back on tour at the end of March. But since COVID ended, I. I like, um, I guess a year ago, summer, I started going, I went to Italy with this folk singer named Tom Chacon and I've recorded records with. And then I went to Texas three times to record this people, one of them Asleep at the Wheel. Okay. We did a 50th anniversary record. Nice. Right? I was with them. I mean, they started in 71. So we do this 50th anniversary record. One of the songs that I recorded with him is nominated for a Grammy, Lyle Lovett sang on it oh wow oh i got an invitation to go to the grammys and which i probably won't be able to go but that was when is that early february yeah february 5th because the last real grammy i mean i have a grammy from playing with them where we recorded one o'clock jump and got a grammy best okay well and i've played on a lot of grammy records but i never actually got the trophy or, or even never got in congratulations, you're nominated for a Grammy oh, as okay. a player. Because yeah, yeah. when you're a sideman on records, you don't get that unless, and this is what people should do, list us bass players as special guest artists. Right, right, right. That in, way, instead we'll get of, a Grammy. Yeah, instead of uh, personnel. Right, and that's and, what like I see Dave Holland puts on his records featuring right i've okay. seen pino featured on some records like that like it'll be the artist right. featuring pino paladino right and that means well pino should be featured well absolutely <laughs> I, I completely agree i completely agree it should give him billing yes yes absolutely <laughs> he's so great um but like that's how that's because i have played on so many records that have won grammys but you don't get one you you could get a certificate if you wanted i guess but um, so that was nice to actually get that a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations on. Uh, oh, that's cool. So, um, but I haven't played with them. I mean, we did this short tour last last year and that was fun. 
But uh, then Bob started touring again. So Bob is, um, that's my main touring thing. I, I don't really have to do much other things. Yeah. And then with the, with the young and now. Right, right, right. Yeah, that'll, boys, that'll take up a lot of time. It's tough, uh, man. Well, man, as these projects start getting released, as the documentary and some of these other recording projects, let me know. Uh, come back on and talk about them when you're able to. I'd love to hear about them. I will, yeah. Cool, man. Tony, thanks so much, man. Thank you, man, and good Absolutely. luck with uh, everything you're doing. And, and thanks for you know supporting the, the base world so greatly. Oh, thanks, so man. Incredible. Thanks. We'll be so in great. touch. I want to have you back on and hear about the projects. Okay, cool. All right, kill it, man. Have a good one. Take care, man. Talk to you later. All right, all right, all right. That was my talk with Tony Garnet. Um... Man, such a great hanging. Like, with, uh, I loved, I loved hearing about his just fascination about jazz uh, and him talking about it and talking about you know that he hasn't had the time to put into it. But clearly, his career has uh, still been really strong with a lot of incredibly impressive things. And I mean, he gets to play with a legend. That's pretty amazing, huh? huh? Playing with Bob Dylan doesn't suck. Uh, in addition to all the other folks he's played with and working on movie soundtracks and all these things, I'm really excited to have him back on the podcast uh, when some when he can speak about some of the projects that are in the works. I'm looking to hear more from him about those things. If you are enjoying the Bay Shed podcast, please hit subscribe wherever you are listening to it. And uh, that's all I got for this one, folks. That's all I got. I will catch you on the next one in a minute.